Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, organizers. Thank you, uh, boarders, for inviting me to join the party. And it's my pleasure to give you an update on the uh, experiments that we've done on uh, one-dimensional semiconductor nanowires, and in particular with a focus on uh, revealing the properties of uh, Majorana fermions in these systems. So this is work done over the past two years or so. So it's a collection of experimental results from the past two years. Uh, from the group, our group in Delft, we collaborate already for a decade with Erik Bakkers, his group, who's a material scientist. So he grows all these nanowires and supports theoretical support. Besides people like Carlo Benek, who are very nearby, Yuli Nazarov, we have a direct help and interaction with uh, Michael Wimmer. So Lenny Glassman already gives you the introduction on these uh, uh, topological systems, Majorana fermions, etc. And the very simple picture that I would like to start from is a, an, uh, a picture where we have bands that are, uh, have a different order on the outside compared to the inside. Uh, so for instance, the uh, valence band in, an, in, uh, in red and the conduction band in blue are normally oriented on the outside, but on the inside it is inverted. And that is sort of the pictorial characteristic of a topological system. If you connect this system to a superconductor, then under the right circumstances, you can have interesting states at these crossing points. And at these crossing points, these, these, these quantum states, they are composed of, uh, sort of loosely speaking, half an electron and half a hole. And these uh, are supposed to be the Majorana fermions that we're looking for. Uh, this system, the system that we're looking for, I mean, you, you, can, you can look at these uh, uh, iron atoms on lead, but we've been using a, a semiconductor nanowire. <coughs> this is here in, in green. We're at the endpoints now. At the endpoints, you expect these special states. So what do you need to do? In 2010, there were two papers with very specific recipes uh, on, on what to do in order to get uh, into the right regime such that these Majorana states emerge from all the other properties. Two papers, 2010, Lucidal and Oregadal, they had a recipe that ha has four ingredients. First of all, you need this one-dimensional semiconducting system. You need spin-orbit interaction. Somehow superconductivity has to be induced. And you have to tune the chemical potential and the magnetic fields at the right values. And it should be a phase that is extended in these parameter space where you are in a topological, a topological superconducting regime including the Majoranas. So 2012, so about two years <coughs> after the first, uh, say, so this, the, not the first predictions, the first predictions were from Kitaev in around 2000, but this, from this specific recipe. Two years after, there were several experiments reported, one from our group in Delft, but also from Lund, Weizmann, Urbana, Harvard, Copenhagen, and you will hear, about, you will hear more from Charlie Marcus about the Harvard Copenhagen results. So what, what has happened since? And in order to discuss it, I would like to you know, go through each of these ingredients first separately before we bring them together to get the, the topological phase. So first of all, the one-dimensional systems are starting point, the semiconducting nanowires. So one-dimensional system, uh, you know, the first thing you expect that if the transport through this one-dimensional system is ballistic, and you have discrete one-dimensional modes, then you can expect things like a quantized conductance. So for that, we know, and actually it's a pleasure to have uh, Michael Pepper as, uh, as our chairman, because we know since 1988 where his group, together with our group in Delft, discovered that in a, small, in a narrow constriction, at that time confined in a two-dimensional system, shows quantized conductance. And this quantized conductance was actually fairly robust <coughs> against scattering. What you need is a ballistic motion in the region around the constriction, but if scattering occurs at a little distance away from the constriction, then the opening angle to actually go back through the constriction is very small. So the probability to go back and destruct the quantum conductance is small in this two-dimensional system. It's much more likely that you scatter off and then end up in the right contact. In the nanowire system, this is different. In the nanowire system, if you induce a small extra confinement, for instance, here in the middle, even if you've passed the constriction but hit the interface with your metallic contact, you can still return. Basically, it's a, it's, it's a large probability to return through the constriction and have, you know, break down you know, the nice quantization of the plateaus. So 
very important, besides having high mobility one-dimensional semiconductor wires, is the interface with the metal, crucially important. Now, we've been working on these metals. It's, it's, it's half chemistry what you have to do to make the, the surface between the semiconductor and the metallic contact as clean as possible. And here's, for instance, a high-resolution <coughs> picture. It's a cross cut through the sample where you see the, uh, the substrate. It's actually a silicon substrate here at the bottom. It's all this black stuff. On top, there's a dielectric layer, this gray stuff. Here you see a, a, a cross plane through the nanowire covered by the gold contact over here. Now, if you look very closely, then you can still see at the bottom of the nanowire a hexagonal structure. That is the, sort of the, 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 the facets of the wire as Eric Buckers gives us the wires after growth. But before putting down the gold, we've been cleaning the surface because there's always a little bit of an oxide layer on the surface. You have to clean it with some chemicals. And what you see in this picture is that the top surface is much more rounded in comparison to the bottom surface. The picture on the screen is more, has more contrast than on this big screen, but the bottom has facets and the top is, is rounded off because of the edging. And this is something that you don't want because here you're actually changing the, uh, you know, the, 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 the properties at the surface exactly at the point where you have transmission from your gold contact into your semiconductor. So thinking about a little bit more and thinking about you know, what kind of system do we actually have in EM and timonite, it grows in the 111 direction. The facets are all in these planes of 110. And at these planes, in EM and timonite is actually quite special. It's a nonpolar facet, meaning that the indium and the antimonite atoms stick out equally much. And so there's not more positive charge compared to negative charge. It is nonpolar at the surface. Of course, until the moment you start chemically treating the surface, then you maybe rip out these, uh, these in the antimony atoms and leave extra indium atoms or vice versa. So this you have to prevent. So if you make your contact, uh, for instance, uh, schematically here, there's in green the semiconductor nanowires and in yellow the gold contacts, then before you put down the gold contacts, you, you clean it. And one way to clean it, doesn't matter what you actually do, one way to clean it is this plasma edge. And it turns out that if you do a plasma edge on this indium and timonite, then you get some band bending at the surface uh, where you do this cleaning step, and the band bending is upwards. And so even if you have a nice metal and a nice semiconductor, at the surface there's a little upward band bending that gives you, you know, reflection of the electrons at the interface. It's a tunnel barrier. On the other hand, if you use a sulfur edge, then actually it turns out there's an accumulation layer at this very surface. So in this case, the electrons experience, don't experience a tunnel barrier when they go from the gold into the semiconductor. They could just, you know, there's, there's a much higher probability to go in. So it's very important, besides having, you know, good wires, that you have good contacts, and this one, uh, you, should be, you should not take this argon uh, plasma edge, but instead, you know, another recipe. If we do that, we make these devices. We have a long, few micrometer long indium timonite nanowires. Here you see a very simple device with gold contacts. There's a gate buried in, this, in the substrate in the back of this plane, so you can change the potential. And if you measure the conductance through the system, you see very clearly that the conductance here in units of 2 e squared over h as a function of gate voltage. If there are no electrons at all in this intermediate section, so it's completely pinched off, the conductance is, of course, zero. But if you open up the constriction, let electrons in there, then the conductance increases to the quantized value, 2 e squared over h, second plateau, et cetera. Also, if you, you know, if you look at this finite bias measurements from these finite bias measurements, you can also extract the subband spacing between these one-dimensional subbands, and various samples give different numbers, but it's always more than 10 milli electron volt. Right? Between 10 and 20, 30 milli electron volt, these are the typical numbers for the orbital subband spacing. Now, this data is not typical data. This is the best data we've ever, ever measured. But if I show you some typical data, you know, it, it still looks okay. Here you see six samples that were all fabricated on the same wafer. They were all measured, and they all show features at the quantized plateau level. And sometimes nicer, sometimes less nice, but they all have that characteristic feature. So what it means is that at, at this stage, with, uh, you know, with, with, with this new sort of focusing on the interface, uh, we not only have quantized conductance in the wire, but you can also measure it from the outside. 
This is all taken as a zero magnetic field. If you now look at, at magnetic field dependence, you get this color scale graph, where dark blue in this case means no conductance, red is high conductance, and here you see these regions of constant conductance in between. And these are again the plateaus. So if I show you some line cuts, here at zero Tesla, this light blue region is the first plateau at two e squared over h. And here you see a little bit of a darker blue region. That's the first spin split plateau, which grows if you increase the field of four Tesla. So from this data, if you look at this difference here, you can extract the, uh, the Zeeman energy, as well as the G factor in this material. And this is very special about indium and timonite. It has a G factor of around 50, which you should realize is 100 times larger than we're used to in gallium arsenide. Uh, so that this is actually you know, one of the reasons that we choose indium and timonite for these studies. So that's a large number. So this is a large energy scale. And we should you know, keep that in mind. So first ingredient, uh, one-dimensional wires, they show quantized ballistic transport. The second <coughs> is spin orbit interaction. And the simple idea is that we have a wire on a substrate. We have a, an electric field asymmetry between substrate and the outside vacuum. That field is perpendicular to the momentum of the electrons in the wire. If you take this outer product, you get effectively a spin orbit magnetic field, meaning that if electrons travel through the wire, they rotate about this axis of the spin orbit field, so they go from up to down, et cetera, et cetera. And the length over which they change their spin by pi, that is what we know as the spin orbit length. How can we probe the effect of the spin orbit energy in, in these indium and timonite nanowires? Again, in simple transport. Complicated slide, but the pictures are actually quite simple. These are the, uh, the spin degenerate uh, one dimensional subbands, the lowest subband. They are, in this case, degenerate because spin orbit interaction is still taken to be zero right here. And if you change your Fermi energy from below here into the subband region, you make a transition in the conductance from zero to one time. 2e squared over h. Now, if you add spin orbit interaction, the picture over here, what you do is you horizontally shift the two parabolas, so you have a separate blue curve for, let's say, spin up, and a red curve for spin down. But if you look at transport in this picture, then still, if you go from below here, if you Fermi energy into the subband region, you immediately hit all the states, the same number of states as you hit in the last picture. So again, you go from zero to a value of 2e squared over h. So simply by measuring the transport from, a, from the case of no spin orbit interaction to the case with spin orbit interaction, you wouldn't see any difference. If you now start applying a magnetic field, and we zoom in on these lower curves in the magnetic field, first of all, a magnetic field that is along the axis of the spin orbit field. In that case, the external field just adds up to the spin orbit field, and you just shift the two parabolas without, you know, making any mixing, introducing any mixing between them. It just adds up to the spin orbit field. If you apply the, the spin orbit field perpendicular, so the external field perpendicular to the spin orbit field, in that case, you start to mix up the states at zero energy where they crossed without an external field. You open up a gap of size to Zeeman energy. And this is an interesting system. Because in this case, with these, if these shifted, vertically shifted parabola, if you change the Fermi energy, from no conductance below, you, you start to hit the first subband. You have one single spin resolved subband. So now you go from zero to half 2e squared over h before you hit both subbands right there, and you go up to one, e squared, one times 2e squared over h. In this case, there's an extra dip introduced that below no conductance. First, if you hit it right here, you go to 2e squared over h. But if you go into this gap, you have less states that contribute to transport, and you drop down to half the value. And this particular gap, with what people call the helical gap, is actually called helical because the right <coughs> movers with positive momentum have a predominantly a spin-up state, whereas the left movers with left uh, momentum, they have the opposite spin. And so spin and, and, and direction, motion, is now strongly coupled. Now, the third case is sort of in between, where the external field is actually under some angle, not, perp not perpendicular, but under some, you know, let's say other angle with the spin orbit field. And in that case, you get the mixture between these two cases, 
So one shifts more down, but nevertheless, you also open up a gap. So first you get the spin resolve plateau if you hit the Fermi energy right there. Then there's a small region in, 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 in energy where you have all the states, so you go to U squared over H before you get into the helical gap and you drop down to half the value. So these are sort of the, the you know, what you can expect if you apply your external field in the presence of a spin orbit field. Now these pictures are hand drawn and they look good, but Daniel Laws and his student Diego Vainis you know, have you know, indicated if you do numerics on a system, it is actually not as simple. There's a sort of a, a complication. And the complication is such that if you model your system with a confi extra confinement in the middle, then you have your, your bands, which uh, let's say are let's say in, in the point with largest confinement are in this case, in this particular where the Fermi energy hits let's say, the, these, these lower energy states. If you move outward to, to, towards your contact, then at some point your potential goes down, all your bands go down, and this will be the, the case in the contact. Now the difficulty is that there's no smooth adiabatic connection between this case in the constriction and this case outside the constriction. Uh, these, these states, if you move them out, they actually have to zene a tunnel into the higher band in order to end up there. So by optimizing parameters like the smoothness of the, of the potential, etc., you can still get features. But the features are not so, you know, not, not as you know, stepwise nice as I showed you in the schematic diagram. But there are these additional oscillations, fiber perot type oscillations, but you can sort of still see sort of that there's this region over here where the conductance is suppressed. On top of these fabry perot oscillations, there's still this region of suppressed conductance. Now, these are line cuts at zero magnetic field, and it actually helps if you also use the magnetic field as an additional parameter. Because if you do that, you can create again these two-dimensional plots, and maybe your eye can sort of smooth out all the oscillations and still see a pattern. Now the pattern that we see in the, in the measurements is uh, this, the, in this panel of gate voltage and magnetic field up to five Tesla. Again, these colors of dark, no conductance, blue, quantized plateau at half the quantized value. Then there's more light color, that's a higher conductance. But then there's this, this region where you go back to the dark blue color. Now this, you, know, you can extend down your simulations to a two-dimensional graph, which was done by Michael Wimmer. And also here, in this case, you, you see this region, this split region, where the conductance goes down. And in the numerics, you actually know what you're doing. So you can extract the associated spin orbit energy if this is really the helical gap. Now, from comparing, you find the spin orbit energy of 4 milli electron volt. Uh, and that's actually a very good value. At least, you know, that's a larger value than we had you know, thought of earlier. Now this, was, this is preliminary data, but at the moment we have another device that actually reproduces this data almost exactly. So you know, we, 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 the confidence is growing that this is indeed the helical gap that we're looking for. Most importantly, actually, we, have, we want to extract this number, which you, know, you could take from this graph as you know, being close, being of order a milli electron volt. Jan. Yeah, I can comment on that. So, so this theory was done as a non-interacting theory, no self-consistency at all. And this is a real experiment, which is a self-consistent experiment. And it's, it's really the, uh, and, and it's really the, uh, uh, we're much more in a constant density regime in, 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 in the experiment in comparison to this uh, calculation. It's from the screening. Uh, this was under an angle, yeah? so, so it, it's under an angle because you first go to, to half the plateau, then you go to a higher value, and then you go back. So you have this region where you, you're under an angle. Yeah. But now we have data. So, uh, my chairman says that we have to have the discussion later on because it is being recorded. Um, but, but, but nevertheless, I want to answer your, your, your question is that, uh, so thing to do is to change the angle. To change, if you change the angle, for instance, you go more perpendicular, then this should decrease and this should grow. And that is what we now see in the new experiments. So let me move on. 
uh, this is the, because well, the helical gap is not so important. What we want to know is what is the value for the spin orbit energy. And we have some alternative measurements based on localization, weak localization, as well as weak anti-localization, where we also extract the spin orbit energy, this ESO, of a value, in this case somewhat smaller, but it's still close to a milli electron volt. So the conclusion is that you know, the spin orbit energy, the Rashba energy, energy scale, is of order a milli electron volt, and that corresponds to a length scale of about 50 nanometer. And kind of interesting, and actually it's important if you compare it to numerics, is that with these values, the spin orbit energy is about the same as the Zeeman energy at one Tesla, which is more or less the magnetic field scale where we are going to look for these Majorana fermions. All right, so next is superconductivity. So for these, to test superconductivity in the system, we, we make various type of devices, including this one where we have a normal contact on the left, gold, in here you see the nanowire. In blue, there's a gate, so we can actually change the potential in this region, make a tunnel barrier here, before the electrons go into the proximitized nanowire section underneath this, this, uh, this purple color. Here we use the iodium titanium nitrine in order to sustain an external magnetic field. <coughs> the first, we will we'll, we'll take away this barrier, so the, the, the voltage on the gate is very positive, and it's very easy for electrons to go from the normal metal into the superconductor. And in this case, what you expect is that processes like Andreev reflection occurs. And, and Andreev reflection has a nice feature that incoming electrons you know, form a Cooper pair if they also grab an electron from below the Fermi C. And this actually enhances the conductance by a factor of two. Because instead of having one charge that is transported, we now have two. So the quantized value for plateaus is four e squared over h instead of 2 e squared over h. Since our wires are nowadays, you know, let's say, wires and contacts show quantized plateaus, we can actually do this comparison. So here again, you see the differential conductance as a function of gate voltage. The red, the red curve is in the normal case, where only electrons or quasi-particles can go through. And this shows a quantized plateau at 2 e squared over h. If we turn on superconductivity, and we actually do this by lowering the bias voltage, you see that there is an enhanced conductance in this region of the plateau. And if you take this value somewhere around here as the enhancement, put it in the formula from Carlo Beinecker from a long time ago, you find that the transmission probability for an Andreev reflection is actually larger than 0.9 in that region. Meaning for us that the contacts are very transparent. So very similar as this quantized conductance with the normal context, also the superconducting context has a very high transparency very close to one. So next, so this is the, the region for enhanced conductance uh, where Andreev reflection contributes to the current. We now change our focus to this region where we actually go into close to the pinch off regime so that we, we apply more negative voltage to this gate. So now there's a tunnel barrier in between. Suppress actually Andreev reflection. You see that the black curve is be below the red curve. And in this regime, we can actually do spectroscopy on the states in the superconducting section. So here's a, a sample. Uh, we actually pinch off the, uh, it's a new sample with more contacts. You can do more things. But we pinch off the upper gate here. So the transport flows from this normal contact and out the superconductor into the electrical circuit, external circuit. These two gates, the big one underneath and the small one that forms a tunnel barrier are actually connected in this particular experiment. And if we change it, we, uh, we see mostly the effect on the conductance from changing the, uh, the, put the, uh, the tunnel barrier in the system. And we apply a field along the nanowire. So the color scale graph of magnetic field vertical and bias voltage horizontal it looks like this. It's actually easier to look at line cuts. First of all, the line cut very close to zero magnetic field. It's a black curve, which has these two BCS-like looking coherence peak and a suppressed conductance in the middle. If you apply a magnetic field at this red dash line, that's at half a Tesla, you pretty much see the same thing. The gap has not decreased very much, and the subgap conductance is still strongly suppressed. So these are just values and you see if you look at the colors that even up to I don't know a Tesla or so you still have an induced gap 
uh, in uh, the indium or in the induced gap in the indium atimonite nanowire. So if you put these ingredients together, yeah, so one lead conductance, large spin orbit energy, there's superconductivity that you can see in this Andreev enhancement as well as the hardish gap. And we can now put all these things together. And you put them together, we're actually also tuning the gate voltage, or tuning the chemical potential in the right region where you have this helical gap. Okay, so this is the picture. Uh, we have our nanowire. There's a gate to change the potential. That gate allows you to induce a tunnel barrier. You, you fill all the electron states up to the Fermi energy. If you add a superconductor to the system, it opens up a gap in the nanowire section, and this gap will actually necessarily go to zero near the end of the nanowire. So there's a decreased gap here as well as on that side. And at these two points, you have space, at least in this lower, let's say, in these regions of lower gap values, where you can have bound states. It's basically a particle in a box bound state, and these are the Andreev bound states. What is nice about these Andreev bound states is that they always come in pairs, and it's symmetric around zero energy. So if you find one at positive energy, there should also be one at negative energy, and that's how you can identify a resonance as being an Andreev bound state. If you make the transition to a topological uh, uh, regime by including spin orbit interaction as well as applying an external magnetic field, then this actually, the superconducting gap gets a different type of pairing. It becomes a P-wave pairing. And now these Andreev bound states, which, which came in pairs on one end, now come in pairs on the two opposite ends. So this, on, this state is now split non-locally, where one occurs on the left and one occurs on the right. They're now taking apart and put at a large distance away from each other. And these states are the ones that everybody's looking for, because these are these Majorana bound states zero energy states. So we take these samples. We, uh, we again pinch off the upper part. So we have a very simple geometry from N to S. And we change the potential on these two blue gates. We measure transport. This is again in the panel of field, magnetic field uh, bias voltage. Here you see the, the, the already the first curve near zero magnetic field. And if you increase the field along the nano wire, you see that all these colors change. Dark, for instance, dark here is very low conductance, also here. Blue is intermediate, red is high conductance. And you see, if you follow the zero bias line, that there's suppression here, there's a, a peak there, and then it's suppressed again. Now, if you take two line cuts again, then at zero magnetic field, we have the black curve. And inside the black curve, there's the, <coughs> the, the PCS uh, uh, coherence peaks you see extra resonances, but they come in pairs. Right? These are the Andreev bound states that come in pairs. If you change the magnetic field further, these pairs, these states, uh, sort of, at least the inner ones, merge, leading to a single peak at zero bias. Yeah? Now, this is a measurement where we have a, a certain gate voltage, and now we're changing the magnetic field and get this spectrum. Next thing you can do is, can we actually extend this zero bias region, zero bias region, if we play a bit more with the gate voltage? If we play with the gate voltage, we may be more centered inside the helical gap, extending the region over which you have a zero bias peak. First of all, let me show you, because this is actually the uh, sort of a, a big peak. If you could tune a little bit of the gate voltage, and sometimes you have the, let's say, a very nice curve. This is a very nice curve, and it's nice in the sense that the height of the peak here exceeds the normal state conductance outside the gap by about a factor of two, or more than a factor of two. So it's not always a peak that is sort of hidden inside the gap. It can you know, come out and be the dominant peak in the spectrum. So if we start changing gate voltage, then, um, and we have a magnetic field, in this case, in, in the x direction. So that's actually perpendicular to the plane <coughs> of the sample. Then this is the typical spectrum. And you have the bias voltage increasing to both ends, gate voltage becoming more positive. So you're adding electrons in the system if you go up. And there's a subgap resonance symmetric around zero that you see with these two lines. If you increase the magnetic field now, but change, but make, take the same graph in terms of gate voltage and bias voltage, 
then you see that these two states come closer together. They start touching each other. If you continue, they really overlap. And of course, the next question is, if you continue with increasing the magnetic field, do they move right through each other, or do they stick, keep sticking to each other? And they stick, still at 360, and also at 450, they still stick. And now they stick at a range in, a, in gate voltage, which you can read off here, which is 100, 150 millivolts. And so here we've optimized also the, the gate voltage range over which this magnetic field, or over which this zero bias peak is, is stable. So there was this other feature of, of spin-orbit interaction that is important. And one way to test if spin-orbit interaction is indeed a crucial ingredient is by actually rotating the magnetic field. So you keep, let's say, the, the amplitude fixed. You sit on your zero bias peak. You keep the amplitude fixed, but now you rotate the field. And there's a various planes. This is the XZ plane, which is this uh, sort of uh, purplish plane which is perpendicular to the y-axis, and the y-axis is our spin-orbit field axis. If I change the um, uh, angle in this plane, if you, and if you think about the spectrum, the gap spectrum inside the system, yeah, as long as you stay perpendicular to the spin-orbit field, the gap spectrum doesn't change very much. Indeed, if you take a measurement and where you rotate over 2 pi, the zero bias peak stays at zero bias, for all angles. Now, there are small splittings for some angles, but you know, more or less it's a zero bias peak over 2 pi. If I now rotate in this blue plane, which, uh, so if I, if I rotate in this blue plane, it occasionally will actually be aligned with the spin orbit field. And pretty much everywhere it will have a component along the spin orbit field. If again you think about the spectrum, this, this component that is along the spin orbit field will actually skew the bands. So you're create some, some gap closing. It's an indirect gap closing. But if you do transport, you, know, you no longer have your gap if you start uh, skewing the field. If you do that and look at the spectrum, then indeed the zero bias peak is basically not, never visible. Maybe there's some crossing points right there. But there's, there's, you know, for, the, for the other angles, uh, it has disappeared. Uh, and this is like, actually at pi over 2, we have the external field aligned with the spin orbit field. Indeed, you see no zero bias peak right there. <laughs> Slightly different samples at different gate voltages you know, show you the same thing. Zero bias peak in the plane where you're always perpendicular to the spin orbit field. But if you have components along the spin orbit field, the zero bias peak disappears. Right? So this rotation is really important. Now, in the remaining minutes, let me show you a few more measurements that uh, actually are a little bit older, but sort of complete the picture of uh, you know, what, what can you expect from Majorana's in this system. First of all, a, um, a prediction that was made by several groups, I just flashed the, the, the prediction or the paper from uh, Sankar da Sarma, that if your system is not infinitely long, so the two Majorana's are not no, infinitely far away from each other, but they are at a finite distance. Their wave functions have some overlap, and this means that the zero bias peak actually will you know, start to, because of this overlap, start to split to finite energy. And this splitting is another feature that one can look after. So here you see you know, another panel where the zero bias peak, so you need a trained eye, but there's a zero bias peak, this red peak along here, which in the line cuts, so this is the same data, but now in terms of line cuts, you see very clearly coming up here in the middle. If I now just change the voltage, sorry, if I now just change the voltage underneath uh, the, uh, the section that is covered by the superconductor, then I effectively make this system smaller from this distance to this distance. So it, it's, it, it, the, the two myrons are separated by this far at the upper panel, but if I change these voltages, I, I make the separation <laughs> smaller, and you do see a splitting coming up in certain regions. And if you look again at the line cuts, you can clearly see this splitting. Now, sometimes this splitting is, is really very clear. For instance, in this particular, it's just another data set. In this particular graph, where the zero bias peak extends over almost a Tesla, and if I change the voltage here right in the middle gate section, it splits up very clearly. 
So what it means in my remaining minute is that by changing something in the middle, you're doing something that does not affect the tunnel barrier. You're doing something that in the middle. So whatever the zero bias peak is, it's not something from the, from, you know, from the outside or the tunnel barriers. And the picture is more like this, where you break the system into two pieces, and effectively you create a smaller distance between adjacent myrhines. Now, let me, under big pressure, and I respect your pressure, uh, continue to the uh, uh, conclusion slides, where if you look at these uh, uh, recipes, what it really defines this recipe from Luchin and Oric is that you, know, you can ex make an extended region in parameter space where you have this topological phase and where you should have Majoranas. Yeah, you should make it as big as possible. It's rigid over a large range in B and gate voltage. And these experiments, what they actually, sh what they actually show is that you know, even in other scenarios, if you, if you have a, another alternative theory for the zero bias peaks, then that theory can no longer, because of these, 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 these experimental data sets, can no longer be based on an effect from a tunnel barrier. It can no longer be based on Coulomb locations because our transmissions at the interfaces are very large, close to one. The wires are ballistic, so your theory can no longer be based on localization effects. And it can also be, not be based on condo effect because of the data that I just skipped. You can show that we have an upper bound for the G factor, which is actually 100 times smaller than we have measured. Now, I cannot be taken, pushed away from the stage without my contribution to, uh, and I have to flip through it, my contribution to uh, you know, Boris, because in early 2000s, 10 years ago, we had a very nice program with Boris and Daniel Laws and Charlie Marcus on qubits, on spin qubits. And I believe that you know, also now the time has started for qubits, but in this case with Majoranas. And I think, as with the spin qubits, I expect you know, as many fine results that we can you know, report at many nice conferences. And uh, if you look at these, these pictures, you always have to you know, look for a few seconds, hey, who are these people? Ah, okay, so, uh, but one person you always recognize immediately. Thank you very much.